I'm really deeply excited to be able to share with you my work focused on depression, which is a major public health issue. So we know from large epidemiological studies that have been conducted in the United States that about one out of every five people will experience an episode of depression at some point in their life. We also know that depression is a disorder that disproportionately affects women. So during childhood, boys and girls experience similar levels of depression, but something happens during adolescence where, boys start to out, where girls start to outnumber boys by a ratio of two to one, and that disparity persists throughout the lifespan. We also know, and many of us know firsthand, that depression is associated with a whole host of negative consequences in the short and long term. Everything ranging from missed educational and work-related opportunities, and in many ways in its most extreme forms with things like suicide. And because depression is so common worldwide, and it's associated with so many negative consequences, we know that depression is currently a leading cause of disability worldwide. Now, one of the things we do know is that exposure to stress and adversity, particularly when it happens during childhood, are some of the biggest risk factors for depression. We know that children, for example, who are exposed to adversity have about twice the risk of developing depression compared to their peers who are unexposed. And this is a really important finding because these kinds of stressors are nearly ubiquitous in our lives today. But we don't really fully understand how it is that stress and adversity actually leads to depression. So there's been a number of different theoretical models or theories that people have put forward in terms of this association. The first is an exposure model, and this model simply says that people who experience adversity have an elevated risk of depression compared to people who are never exposed. There's also been a model put forward around accumulation, and this focuses on the amount or duration of exposure, and this says that risk for depression increases in a dose-response manner as a function of the amount of exposure. There's also been a recency model put forward that focuses on the time since the onset of exposure. And here the idea is that risk for depression is elevated in the short term after exposure and dissipates across time. And then the last model is a sensitive period model. And this model suggests that there are specific ages in the course of the lifespan when exposure to adversity would be even more potent in conferring risk for depression. And I think being able to understand which one of these theoretical models drives risk for depression is really important because it's going to shape how we intervene. So if it's an exposure model, it suggests that we want to identify people who've experienced these stressors, but we can do that at any point in life. If it's an accumulation model, it suggests we want to identify people early. If it's a recency model, it suggests we want to intervene quickly. And if it's a sensitive period model, it suggests that we want to intervene shortly before or during those age stages when people are most sensitive. And this is an area of focus of my research work, is trying to identify these sensitive periods in development, which I think of as being high-risk periods or windows of vulnerability when adverse experiences are mo more potent, but also windows of opportunity when our interventions and protective factors might be even more beneficial in offsetting risk for depression. There's a number of different unanswered research questions in this area that my research group is tackling. The first is exactly when are these sensitive periods? When do they occur in the course of development? And how are they involved in shaping risk for depression? Another is what matters more? Which one of these theoretical models is really driving risk for depression? Is it just simply about being exposed? Is it how much you're exposed? When in terms of recency? Or something about a sensitive period model and developmental timing? Another is how exactly does stress and exposure to adversity cause depression? What are the biological mechanisms? How is it that stress specifically gets into our body to make us vulnerable for developing depression? And then finally, what genes might be involved in shaping when sensitive periods turn on and turn off to ultimately shape risk for depression?
And I think being able to answer these questions is important for helping to understand not only the mechanisms underlying risk for depression, but to also identify opportunities for targeted interventions that can be delivered in ways that are uniquely timed to be most effective and efficient. So this project that is supported by the One Mind Foundation is going to provide an opportunity for me to be able to better understand how stress and exposure to adversity gets under the skin and influences risk for depression. And so as I mentioned before, we know that stress is associated with risk for depression, but we don't really know how this relationship unfolds over the cross of the lifespan and we don't know how the characteristics of adversity matter in terms of shaping risk. We also don't really know what stress actually does in terms of the biology, what changes happen as a result of stress exposure to then make people more vulnerable to developing depression. And so what we're planning to do is to be able to better understand one particular biological pathway which involves epigenetic changes. And so epigenetics is a mechanism for controlling when and how our genes are expressed. So every cell in our body has an identical genome. This is true whether it's a muscle cell or a liver cell or a brain cell. But what's really remarkable is that these cells act in different ways, and they can do that as a result of changes that happen in terms of these chemical tags that get added to the sequence of our DNA, which change how our genes are expressed. And these particular chemical tags are called epigenetic marks. And you can think about epi as being the Greek word for above, so above the genome. And what we know is that these epigenetic marks cause some genes to be turned on and other genes to be turned off. One of the most commonly studied types of epigenetic marks is something called DNA methylation. And what's been really interesting is that there's work been done by many folks in this room that shows that evidence that our life experience can influence the DNA marks that we have in our genome. And as an example of that, we recently um, completed a study where we looked at the effects of exposure to stress and adversity on DNA methylation in a longitudinal sample called the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children. And in that data set, it was very unique in that we had the opportunity to be able to look at repeated exposure to adversity, a number of different domains, ranging from everything from caregiver physical and emotional abuse to characteristics of the neighborhood environment. And we were able to look at DNA methylation at over 400 different sites in the genome. And what we did was we said, well, what theoretical model that I described earlier explains most amount of the variation in DNA methylation? Are we seeing evidence more strongly for accumulation, recency, or a sensitive period model? And this study was unique because most studies that had been done previously really only test that exposure model and simply look at people who are exposed versus unexposed. And so what we found is 40 DNA methylation marks that were distributed throughout the genome that showed evidence of being significantly affected by exposure to adversity. When we looked deeper into those 40 different loci, we plotted the data in terms of these different theoretical models. And what we found was pretty strong evidence for sensitive periods. So of these 40 DNA methylation marks, we found that more than half were identified as being influenced by exposure to adversity that happened specifically during infancy or in the first three years of life. And this is pretty remarkable in being able to say that of all of these different ways that stress can manifest on our bodies, that it looks like there's some evidence that the developmental timing of when these stressors occur seems to matter most in terms of shaping DNA methylation. And so now what we're going to do, and we're very excited about this with the support of the One Mind Foundation, is to be able to leverage the power of using multiple data sets to explore these relationships on a much larger scale. And so with this award, we're going to be integrating data from up to 39 different birth cohorts where we have repeated measures of exposure to a range of different adversities, 
DNA methylation, and risk for depression. And with that data, we're going to be able to accomplish three primary goals. So the first thing is that we'll be able to develop a consistent set of measures of stress exposure and depression across studies. The second is that we'll then be able to look at the characteristics of exposure in terms of the relationship between prenatal stress and DNA methylation birth, and then also the relationship between postnatal stress and DNA methylation during childhood and adolescence. And then as a third aim, we'll be able to link that to risk for depression during adolescence. And what we hope to learn from this work is whether DNA methylation is a plausible biological mechanism linking exposure to stress to risk for depression, what genes might be involved in this relationship, and perhaps most uniquely, when might be optimal times in the course of development that we want to intervene to offset risk for depression and mitigate the negative consequences of exposure to adversity. So with that, I'd like to thank the Staglin family again for this generous support from the One Mind um, Rising Star Award. Um, I work with a very fantastic group of lab members who um, are listed here. And thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions you have.